our scripture this morning. It's from 2 Peter. Thank you for that song, David. 2 Peter 3, verse 14. And it says, Therefore, beloved, since you're waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. I'm going to turn the time over to Pastor Gary. May God bless us as we study his word this morning. Some of you will remember 1980, Lake Placid, New York. What happened? What? Miracle on ice, they call it. The U.S., for the first time ever, won a gold medal in ice hockey. They beat the Russians. That was an amazing thing. And then they had to beat Finland, and they beat him. And they won, cheering all over. But there's something else that happened. Lake Placid, New York. It was February, the last two weeks. It was the Winter Olympics. There was a speed skater by the name of Eric Haydn. He won all five gold medals. The 500, the 1,000, the 1,500, the 5,000, and the 10,000 meter races. He won them all. No big surprise, everybody knew he was going to do that. And you think, well, that's kind of disheartening. And by the way, those five gold medals and the gold medal the hockey team won were the only gold medals the U.S. won that year. So you think, five gold medals, Eric Hyden? That's just amazing. But he had won the world championship for the last three years People knew what he could do, and you'd think, well, that's kind of disheartening for the competitors. I mean, he's going to win. Why try? But just the opposite. People wanted to race against Eric Hyden. So in the 500 meter, he made 38.03 seconds. That's fast. That was an Olympic record. And the next fella was Russian uh, by the name of Eugeny Kulikov, came in second. And he did the fastest he had ever skated before in his life. Why? Because he was racing against somebody faster than him. And it made a difference, and he was excited excited to do his own personal best. Well, the same thing in the 1,000. 1,000 meters, Eric Hyden did 1 minute, 15.18 seconds. Well, that was a new Olympic record as well. And the second place was a Canadian, Gaten Boucher. And he was excited because he turned in his own personal best. He had never skated the 1,000 that fast before. Well, that was exactly true for all of the medal winners. Silver, the bronze, they all did faster than they had ever done before. And they were excited to be racing in competition with Eric Hyden. Well, Eric Hyden was (laughs) kind of a humble sort of fellow. He said, gold medals, what good are they? If they'd given me a warm-up suit, that would have been worth something. But winning five gold medals, it had never been done in Olympic history. And he was, everybody was after him to speak, to promote this, to promote other things. He could have been a very wealthy man. No, I just like to skate. And he skated well. Well, there came out to be the Haydn effect. And the definition is this. It's achieving a new personal victory by striving to equal a competitor one knows he can never be equal to or surpass. That's the Haydn effect. And that is true in so many things. People see somebody else 
doing really well. And I said, well, never be able to beat him. He's got a special gift. But I'd sure like to race against him. I'd sure like to race with him because they can do better than they ever have done before. And so we come to something called the Jesus effect. Does he have that influence on us? Uh, we're never going to surpass him as far as character development. We're never going to be sin free. It's too late for that. But you know, he invites us into a race. And he invites everyone to race as though you're going to win. It's none of this, well, you participated. No. <laughs> Race to win. In other words, give it your all because that Jesus effect will affect our lives. He can motivate dedicated Christians. He's not going to motivate not dedicated Christians. He will bring out the best in people because we keep our eyes on him. Way too often we lose sight of Jesus, and we see all the glitter, we see all the lights, we get excited about the music, we get excited about promotions, we get excited about all these things the world has to offer. And we take our names off, our eyes off of Jesus, and what happens? We lose sight of the goal, and it affects us. The Jesus effect wants to bring out the very best in us. You know, Philip, Philippians talks about choosing those things that are excellent. That's Jesus. 1 Corinthians 9, 24, it says, Run in such a way as to get the prize. No half-hearted attempts. No, you're going to... The prize is for a number of people, not just first, second, and third. And that effect is going to be pretty important in our lives. In, uh, you know, there's five really things that, five things that can really make an effect. And that effect of Jesus on us can change us into a very stronger character. And the first one is like love, for example. John 3.16, of course. And um, person is willing to give maybe their life for their friends, but Jesus gave his life for sinners. And studying his life of love can have an effect on us, a profound effect. In January of 1982, there was a plane crash, Air Florida, Boeing 737. A lot of things happened. There was a snowstorm, it kind of abated, planes were starting to take off, but this plane probably should never have gone. But the pilot, the co-pilot said, let's do it. So off they went, they got, they didn't even get 500 feet off the ground hardly before it started coming down and it ran into the Brooklyn 44th Street Bridge. The uh, tail came off went into the water, all the rest of the passengers died in the fuselage. But in the tail, there was five passengers and one stewardess. And they came out of that tail. And they were flopping around, and the helicopter got over there, brought down a lifeline. And one fella caught the lifeline and gave it to the person next to him. And that person was rescued. Helicopter came back. He caught the lifeline. He gave it to somebody else. They were rescued. And they were worried about, well, the water's so cold, how much longer? And so they took two at a time the next time. And they came back for this last individual. And he was gone. He couldn't survive the cold. Nobody knew him. He wasn't friends of anybody. he just do it because... There is something going on inside. Others mattered more than his own life. We uh, think about self-sacrificing lives, and we always have to think, well, Jesus, Jesus did it. And there's a number of people who gave up their lives because they had care for somebody else even more. Endurance, for example. 
Endurance was another one of those things that Jesus demonstrated so well. He fasted in the desert for 40 days, and he was still able to beat the devil. The devil thought, well, in his weakened state, he'll be easy. He'll be a pushover. Not Jesus. He had his eyes on God, and he was able to still remember those scripture of strength. Yes, every time Satan came up with something, Jesus had a scripture. No, I can't do that. That is not a part of my mission. That's not who I am. That's not what I do. And finally, the devil had to give up. Jesus met with Pharisees. He met with Sadducees. He met with other leaders. He met with Roman officials. All these people didn't have an effect on Jesus. Jesus had an effect on them. Remember Nicodemus? Jesus had an effect on Nicodemus. Didn't change his life a lot at first, but after the resurrection, it did. Well, Jesus suffered the whip. He had nails of the cross, but he was still able to say, God, forgive them. They just don't understand. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3 says, to endure hardship. Well, yeah, we've been doing that all right. But are we keeping our eyes on Jesus or are we whining? Yeah, we endure hardship, but let me tell you about it. You got an extra two or three hours? No. Jesus didn't whine ever because his eyes were focused on Jesus or on God. And our eyes need to be on Jesus because his are on God. That is the Jesus effect. Boldness. Jesus had a boldness that is pretty rare. At age 12, he went into the temple. He wasn't afraid to ask questions. He went and asked questions about what the Messiah would be like. He, at that time, it's believed that he fully understand the sacrifice of the lamb. And he had questions. He wanted to know. He was bold. He uh, went to the temple years later. Money changers don't belong in the temple courtyard. All these animals don't belong here. This is to be a place of worship. This is to be a place of prayer. That's boldness. Do we get embarrassed to ask a blessing on a prayer in a restaurant? I know. It used to be months ago when we went to restaurants. But <laughs> do you get embarrassed or do you quickly thank you, God, What's on the menu? Are you ready to speak up when somebody asks you about, why are you different? What do you do on Saturday mornings anyway? Are you ready to tell them? Or are you embarrassed? Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And God, look what it got him. Beatings, shipwrecked. Um, he was stoned once. Put in prison. And eventually he was executed. But he was not ashamed of Jesus. Because Jesus had an effect on him. Ever since that time he went to Damascus, there was an effect, the Jesus effect on Paul. Changed his life. Thousands of people have been changed because of the Jesus effect. Well, another part of Jesus' ministry was his compassion. Everybody knew about his compassion because he healed, he cared about people. He wasn't too proud or arrogant to talk to poor people or foreigners or people who didn't have much. That was his purpose, to meet all the needs. Anybody ever hear of a person called Dale Henry? Anybody? Well, obviously he's not as famous as I think he is. He is a nationwide known um, what do I want to say? He's a, a motivator. He's a speaker. He talks to all the great big country or companies and he motivates them in ways of service. That's what he does. He goes to uh, meeting after meeting and he does about 180 of these meetings per year. And so he's quite busy. And he was uh, down in Phoenix, Arizona, doing one of these meetings and the motel there was not one of these great big high-rise things. It was all kind of spread out in these little bungalows. And 
he was in the lobby there getting ready to go, and somebody taps him on the shoulder and said, uh, excuse me, I need some help with my luggage. And then just went out the door. So Dale says, okay, followed him out. And he went quite a ways to one of these bungalows, and he opened the door, and there was the two biggest suitcases he had ever seen in his life. Now, Arizona in August is fairly warm, usually quite a bit above 100. So Dale grabbed those suitcases and followed this guy back to the lobby. And about halfway, the guy says, do you know what time it is? And Dale says, sweating, really sweating, because that was hard work carrying. And he's a short guy. He's not a very big guy. He's probably 5'6", five, maybe 5'5", five, five, something like that. He's carrying these great big old suitcases. And uh, the guy says, what time is it? And whew, puts the suitcases down, looks at his watch. And he said, by the way, do you know when the next shuttle is to the airport? And Dale said, yes, I do. It happens to me. And he gave the time, and I'm on it. And the guy looks at him. You're not a bellhop, are you? No. Why are you carrying my suitcases? Because you asked me to. <laughs> service. That's service. How many times are you at a grocery store or a hardware store or some store and somebody comes up to you and say, Excuse me, do you know where the chocolate is? <laughs> do you know where the hammers are? Do you know where the car batteries are? And you say, that's not my job. I don't work here. That's not service. Well, I'm not getting paid to serve. Why should I serve? What would Jesus say? Dale Henry said, yes, I'll help you. And he would go and he would do whatever they asked because they asked. That's service. Well, this fella, who was a vice president of one of the great big companies in the United States, says, why are you carrying my suitcases? Because you asked me. And they started talking about, who are you anyway? He says, well, I'm a motivational speaker. I do about 180 of these meetings. I just got through doing one for um, this particular company. He says, oh, yes, I've heard about that. And Dale said, you know, can we finish this conversation in the air-conditioned lobby? And so he went on and finished carrying the suitcases, and then they talked. Another time, he was in Miami, Florida, and his wife happened to be with him. And, you know, wife, and he has two girls, and there was about an hour or so before he had to go give his speech, and uh, he went down to the men's clothing store that was a part of this great big, huge uh, hotel complex. You know, they have meeting rooms. He was to give this presentation to about 3,500 salespeople. So it was a big thing, and he was down there and looking, and being a short fella, he's, he wears a 38 short suit. Now, you go to stores, and you don't find very many 38 short, and if you do, it's one nobody wants. So he was looking, and wow, they've got a whole bunch, and so he was excited looking at the different ones. And somebody taps him on the shoulder and says, can you mark my trousers for me, please? And in, on his shoulder or uh, arm was some trousers, and back in those days, they tailored things. Well, they needed Mark. Says, so he went into the, sure, I'll be glad to help you. So the fellow went into the dressing room, put on those trousers, and he grabbed a piece of chalk and started marking where they needed to be taken in. Well, Dale happened to be working at a men's clothing store in college. And so he knew what to do. So he did it and uh, marked him. And the guy went back in the changing room. And so Dale went right back into the 
place where all the 38 short suits were. And he was looking at him and admiring him and wow, here's a really nice one. And he gets another tap on the shoulder. Can you ring this up for me, please? And he says, sure, I'll take you right over. In the meantime, there was, he had looked around. There was nobody in the store. But this time he looked and there was somebody over near the cash register. He looked at him and he saw the name tag and it said Israel. And the store's name was Nick's Clothing. So he says, well, here's somebody right here. And he, please ring up these trousers for uh, my friend here. So the fellow rang it up, and uh, the customer left. There's nobody else in the store. And so the fellow who rang up says, who are you anyway? And why are you marking strange people's trousers for them? And he says, well, that's what I do. He asked me, and I didn't see anybody in the store, so I did what I knew to do. I marked them for him. But what are you, who are you? What are you doing? Well, I'm here. I'm going to speak to these salespeople, 3,500 of them. And I believe in customer service. That's why I come to speak. I never use the word, that's not my job. And I never say, I wish I had, because he always does. Well, they talked for several minutes, and then Dale had to go. He didn't buy that third, or, uh, 38 short suit that he was admiring, but he says, come with me. You came in the store for a reason. What is it? And he says, the tie. I've got this tie my wife picked out for me. I don't like it. And the uh, fellow who happened to be the owner of a chain of these Nick's men's clothes over there, up and down the East Coast, he says, you're right, it's not the right tie for giving at a convention. He says, come with me. And he showed him some nice ties, and he looked them all over, and he felt them, and he took the tie, and he put it up against Dale's chest there, and he says, yes, this is the tie for you. And it was a really nice tie, and he says, that is what you're looking for. So Dale says, thank you. And he started reaching for his wallet. He said, no, no, no. Your money isn't any good here. Well, why? You know, um, all I did was mark his trousers. You know, I don't deserve a free tie for that. And he says, you know, you taught me about customer service. You see, this morning I was going to close the store because my um, manager called in sick. Two or three of the salespeople called in sick. I have to operate the store all by myself. I was going to sit in the back and hope nobody came all day. But you have taught me the pleasure and the joy of helping and serving people. You see, Dale's a Christian. He has the Jesus effect. And the Jesus effect made him think that I don't turn people down. They need help. They ask for help. I help people. That's what I do. That's what Jesus did. He served people. So he said, this tie is yours. Well, he takes the tie upstairs. His wife sees it. And he says, whoa, are you special or what? And he said, what do you mean? Somebody gave me a tie. What's so special about that? And he says, that's a $125 tie. That's quite a nice tie. Well, he goes to the convention. He gives his speech. And that night, as he was going back to the hotel room, and it was getting kind of late, and he expected that store would be closed. But somebody says, Dr. Henry, just a minute, come over here. What, you still open? Yes, I've had a very busy day. You see, 750 of those people who attended your convention came into my store. They bought hundreds of suits, 450 suits, and shirts, and underwear, and ties, and blazers. And I served every one of those myself. <laughs> and I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. And he says, this is for you. 
what is it? I don't deserve anything. He says, yes, you do. You taught me to appreciate service. That's the Jesus effect. And it was a really nice suit. Well, <coughs> Dale had a way of not just how can I help you, how can I help just you? He made people feel that it was a privilege to help them. I got a phone call the other day. This lady calls up. She's from Dryden, by the way. She says she's an Adventist member. I need some help. How can I help you? Well, Wenatchee Church is giving out food baskets. And uh, I need a ride home. I said, how are you getting there? By bus? And you can't take the bus home? Oh, no, the box will be too heavy for me. You see, I'm disabled. Well, I will help you. And I did. I went there, and there was not just a box of food, but there were three boxes plus some other stuff. And so good thing I brought my pickup. And she said, oh, by the way, can we stop at the uh, grocery outlet on the way home? Oh, sure. And 40 minutes later, she comes back with a huge cart full of stuff. We load it all back into the back of the pickup. Good thing I was bringing my car. And we went. And I helped her bring all the stuff into her little tiny cabin there in Dryden. You know, service is something that identifies who we are. When people look at us, and when they hear our name, what do they think? Oh, that's the fellow always harping on this, or he's always whining, or he's always, or she is always complaining. Is that what the reputation we have? That's not the Jesus effect. Now, there's people who will misunderstand us, yes, and maybe they'll get us wrong, but we ought to be known for our service and our love, our compassion, our boldness, our endurance, that's the Jesus effect. That makes us different than other Christians, other people of the world. And Dale Henry did what he talked about in these motivational seminars. I had the opportunity to hear him live. It was a great thing. So what is your job? What is your job really? I mean, you say, well, you know, I, I trim trees, or I do electrical, or I'm a plumber, or I, I'm retired. What is your real job? Isn't your real job to serve people, to tell them about Jesus? We've got a new year coming up. Yeah, it's a made up year, I mean, Somebody arbitrarily chose this particular day and they chose midnight to be the change. That's not at all what God set up. But that's what we have. What's going to be different about this new year? Are you going to purposely plan to have Jesus affect your life more than he has this past year? I mean, when Jesus came to Paul and said, why are you persecuting me? Paul wasn't a very young fella. He had already established himself. But he changed. You think of Joseph. Joseph would say, well, you know, I'm being persecuted. I mean, my brothers don't like me. My brothers tried to kill me. I mean, things are looking pretty tough. I finally get this job, not so bad job. I'm a slave, but it's not a bad job serving Potiphar. And then I get falsely accused and sent to jail. And somebody asked, hey, I've got a problem here. And Joseph says, how can I serve you? How can I serve just you? Well, he had the God effect, the Jesus effect in his life. And it made a difference in the way he responded. Daniel. Daniel had difficulties. I mean, going to be a eunuch. In Babylon, surely that's not God's plan, but you see, God could use Daniel if God was still in his life. 
Well, we have that same opportunity, every one of us. Some of us are doing it. Some of us could do it even better, keeping our eyes focused on Jesus and letting him change the way we look at others. That's what the Jesus effect is. Everybody wanted to race against Eric Hayden because they knew they could be a better racer by looking at him, by racing with him. We can be better Christians by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Father, we want that Jesus effect because we know you're coming soon. We know that this whole world is not going to be the same anymore. You're going to make it completely over again. But Father, we need your help so that you are a bigger influence on our lives. Father, we need reminders to keep our eyes on you, to do the things that you did and not be so selfish that we don't have time for anybody else. Thank you, Father, for being the strength, for being the courage, for being all that we need. Thank you. May our new year be the best yet because you're more a part of our life. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.